everyone to this uh, to this uh, transformation talk. I'm very pleased to be able to have uh, uh, Carolina da Costa with us. And uh, the topic today really would be about unpacking the transformative power of the three pillars of the corporate uh, sustainability. How, because sometimes we ask, ask our, ourselves one question, how can ESG, and by ESG I mean environmental, social, and governance be a pivot for transformative change in organizations. But before I move forward, let me just introduce uh, Carolina. Carolina is a partner at Mauer Asset Management. She helps build new business model to basically support entrepreneurship, ESG, and impact. So she has over 20 years of experience in high growth, nonprofit, Social, social impact project, as well as organization based on innovative strategic models of action and governance. She served as the vice president at INSPER, INSPER which is a teaching and research uh, university in Brazil. And uh, she also served as the dean of, of the undergraduate program where she leads the entrepreneurship, she led the entrepreneurship uh, center. Now, of course, to set the stage here, we do hear people talking about ESG and the question that we could ask ourselves, how might an ESG agenda transform organizations? So before we dive deep, what I would like to do is for us to go through the topic in three stages. First, let us set the ground, let us set the stage, let us look at the whole ESG. So taking all three elements, how can they help transform organization? What is the transformative power of each of the ESG uh, pillars? So this would be the first question for Carolina that she will be, I mean, and I want this to be more like a conversation. So she'll be able to actually go through and help us uncover the transformative power of each of the ESG uh, element. Carolina, welcome. Thank you very much, Tahiro, for the invitation. Um, I'd like to compliment the whole audience and say that I'm very honored to be here, sharing some thoughts and experience with, uh, with all of you. So this is an important question, Tahiro, especially considering that uh, corporate sustainability is not new to companies. So companies have been engaged in this type of topic for decades. And uh, recently, to the attention given from the financial market, where I am in right now, we see a more uh, strong interface between financial sector and companies, and then creates lots of pressures and opportunities for companies to really make a transformation in their business models. So coming from awareness of corporate sustainability, the importance of considering their impacts in their economic uh, production uh, business models, then with the incorporation of this uh, integration with the financial market, companies now have the they have to report more information and that creates a, a change power in the way they organize themselves in terms of reporting, in terms of uh, how they actually gonna have the relationship with investors. And from the side of the financial sector, it creates a whole pressure for new modes of information that is gonna be apprehended in the uh, model, uh, precification model, risk model, and how actually the financial sector puts values in companies. And that's not for a stock market, it's also for financing. And for, from the side of the company, this whole context, and uh, which is more than just awareness, it's a new way to discuss capital allocation, uh, creates for companies several opportunities to actually revise their, their, their production mode, their business mode, so they follow a transition to a low carbon economy. 
And that creates opportunities for innovation, that creates opportunities for, for new financial, financial, uh, financing modes. Uh, so the whole set of, uh, of issues that we, we'll be able to discuss throughout this conversation. So we have now the very strong participation, at least from the uh, asset managers and banks that are really into the agenda of low, low carbon economy and that putting like a, a public uh, uh, commitments that they're gonna just invest in, uh, in, in a real economy that is committed with low carbon uh, agenda. So this whole set of uh, new information, so creates lots of opportunities for companies to transform and to really take advantage of this movement to new for innovation, for transformation, and so forth. Thank you, Carolina. And then if we can dive a little bit uh, deeper now, uh, taking environmental, or maybe taking social, and taking governance, on each of these three, what is happening? What are organizations doing? And what is pushing organizations to transform? So let's start maybe on the environmental front. What is happening? What is creating that need to transform? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good way to organize the, the thinking at our hero. So from the side of environmental, uh, when the financial sector starts to require reporting on carbon footprint and all other risks associated, associated to climate, companies have, first of all, to make a strong effort to increase and transform their reporting system. So especially for investors who have a strong or a significant share of the business, they will have, companies will have to make a strong case for reporting that is very clear and objective in terms of carbon footprint, in terms of risks that is not on climate, but also the S, the social risks, that is very tied to reputation and branding and uh, their like a mission in the society. So it's not just a marketing thing, uh, it's much more than that. So it's a whole issue of how they're gonna be perceived by their employees, by their clients, by their, by their suppliers, so by, by the whole ecosystem. So uh, the, the, this new requirement that financial sector imposes to companies, especially those who have a strong share of the business, makes, company, uh, makes, makes companies more pressured to improve reporting system. And also that is actually coupled with risk assessment and opportunity assessment. So why is that? Uh, why is everybody's concerned with that right now? Well, we are living the, 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 this like a global tragedy, which is COVID, that actually exposed that risk assessment is a, is a huge issue that has to be much more addressed and accounted for by who actually evaluate businesses. And talking about uh, climate change uh, and uh, the need the countries and governments will have to put like a, uh, 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 to put a, a limit in carbon footprint. So lots of sectors will be impacted by a possible regulation in the carbon market. It's gonna put a price on this type of externalities. So the whole, the whole point from the economic view is the price of externalities. The governments will more and more make that to be part of the company's balance sheet. And when that becomes part of their balance sheet, uh, they have to actually uh, make the case for cost of capital. So reporting is the starting point of the whole E thing. And reporting has everything to do with improvement of risk assessment, with improvement of long-term view of externalities, and the changes in market regulation that can put a cost, a very strong cost in the cost of capital when the companies will look for access to capital for financing their operations and their investments. 
So uh, that creates a cascade effect that makes company, if they wanted to do adequate risk assessment, if they wanted to incorporate that view of long-term impact and externalities in order to change their business, that creates a whole uh, chain reaction that makes companies have to rethink their governance, that makes companies to rethink innovation, they have companies to rethink access to capital. Uh, and I would say the same for S. So the same mental model that companies are using for E, they have to use for S because S is like all the social impacts and very readily environmental issues are only environmental. They are also social because they create like a constraints in communities that creates uh, uh, impacts in employees, in, in, the, in the suppliers, in the, in the, in the whole ecosystem the company is embedded in. So uh, when you look at the, like this systemic view of risk assessment that not only looks at environmental, but also the intricacies of the environmental uh, uh, as, uh, aspects with the social, that uh, actually put a very, relevant pressure on how to improve governance, which is the G of the equation. Thank you, yeah, thank you. And, and, and of course, you know, when, when you see uh, an acronym with three, four letters, of, I mean, in this case, three, sometimes people ask, which one is the most difficult to put in place? Is it the environmental side? Is it the social? Is it the governance within the, the organization? Which one do you see organizations struggle the most with these days? I think it is a, it is a question that is very, it's very debatable. And uh, like, uh, I don't want it to sound like certain of, the, <laughs> of my answer because this is, those are the type of things that people do discuss. Uh, but I'd like always to look at the ESG as an equation model in which you have variables that are uh, within uh, more control than others. Uh, of course, uh, you as a company has to, to do your mission to mitigate uh, environmental and social externalities, but not only mitigate, but to transform, to create prosperity. Of course, that is it. this is within companies' hands. But without question, what is most in companies' hands is the governance. And for companies to change their mindset, like their corporate mindset, this is a whole issue of how leadership organizes and changes the, the culture, how actually uh, organizes the, the role of the board, how it organizes the committees that we're going to assist and is going to have the participation of the, the, all the stakeholders. So it has to, to, to carry a stakeholder deal. Um, and you also have the importance of walk the talk. So you have to look at compensation. You have to look at how you actually uh, walk the talk in terms of the culture you wanted to create. So I would say, very humble here, it's like, uh, like my opinion based in, in everything I observe, uh, especially with my hat of a professor, like, like uh, helping to form boards and C-level of companies. Uh, the governance is something that is the beginning of everything. So how the company is really going to change it, the functions of their executives to incorporate this whole view of prosperity. So it's a change in the mental model. And I don't want it to sound philosophical because this is a very pragmatic thing. So when the, like the main uh, executive search firms in the world are redefining the roles of the C-level to actually rephrase, like re revisit the role of the CFO, the role of a possibly a chief sustainability officer the, of the CEO and especially of the boards. So boards have to take the, the lead on, uh, make this, the companies to have a different way to look their impact 
and and also with a view of long long term. So what what like the boards can have that look, and this is the look that uh, investors, uh, uh, institutional investors have. So boards can definitely be, and for me, this is the G, this is the governance, uh, this is the beginning of the, the whole transformation. Thank you so much. I prefer to think that, uh, Tahiro, then I could make a case that, no, the change is going to come from the pressure of the environment. So that is going to look at companies and, and see them as too reactive. What I believe they can be very proactive because the proactivity uh, is going to make them capture much more value. It's like the first mover advantage that we all know from a strategy. So companies that wait just to react, we're not going to be able to capture the value of ESG transformation and ESG value creation. Thank you, Carolina. And this is quite insightful. I mean, I've been sometime doing some um, some uh, maturity assessment, uh, capacity assessment, and uh, usually we look at one pillar that is called governance. And we tend to see that whenever the governance is good, sometimes all the other parts tend to take care of themselves or tend to be kind of uh, um, uh, taken seriously. But when the governance is not working, then it seems like the whole thing is unstable. Uh, and then getting to move or getting to get the different pieces aligned becomes a, a challenge. Of Absolutely. Course, now, moving on to the next, the next point here, uh, everybody is talking about it and it's been there for a long time. And then sometime when you talk about ESG or especially the environmental part, uh, you hear people pushing back saying, I mean, is, is it something that there will be reward or is it something that will be uh, or, I mean, beneficial, let's say, for them and maybe for society at all. Can you maybe share with us how are organizations that have fully embraced the ESG, how are they performing vis-a-vis -vis those who haven't? And from performance, I'm not looking only on financial numbers. Of course, that is important, but also the happiness of people within the organizations and, uh, and, and this type of thing. So we have all dimensions in terms of performance, financially, of course, and then uh, the happiness of people between the organization and the difference that the organization is also making the world. Do we have any data point to compare? We have many studies on that. Um, I also, I always like to cite the economic argument so that we, we, we take this conversation down to earth, uh, not sounding as like a, an, a, new, a new topic uh, statement. So we have studies that show very clearly, and uh, some folks from Harvard Business School, Sarah Finn and its colleagues, his colleagues, uh, have shown several studies uh, following data over 10 years, um, over 50 industries, uh, over uh, more than six sectors, showing that when you look at ESG materiality, what is ESG materiality? Are elements of that industry that make it, make that, that industry perform well in terms of uh, results. Not so, talking about only financial results, on being like the leader in the sector, to be like an industry that is seen by the customers as producing value, so this is the SG materiality. It's like these elements that makes companies excel in their activity. So when you take those elements and you look at the financial results in the financial market, you see clearly companies performing six to ten two percent to six percent alpha in the financial market. And I'm looking at a very long a uh, series of data, looking at 10 years most. So this is definitely something that has been shown and proved. But I don't want to only look at the financial results. We haven't seen Tahiro, and I think the pandemics make that much stronger, that people don't want to, like there's less is room for fragmentation between personal life and work life. So I'm here with you 
in this home, like home office conversation. And sometimes I see your kid running behind you. And uh, so the lines between private and public life is becoming, is becoming less and less uh, visible. So people don't want to have like personal statements that are very different from their corporate statements. So when you have that alignment, when you feel as a professional that you are living uh, like a professional statement that it's, is aligned with your personal statement, so you feel proud of yourself in terms of uh, why you are generating, that your company is taking care of the community, that the company is walking the talking and being coherent in their compensation uh, practices that match their, their, their cultural values. People, and did, there are lots of studies that show that, people feel much more enlightened, much more inspired, and that creates a whole set of uh, creativity energy, commitment energy, engagement energy, and we know that is key for sustainable prosperity. So I think that's, for me, the strongest case uh, for companies really to engage. It's not just, and, and, and if you see, for example, you take Brazil as a reference, um, and you see companies that have excelled for the past years in terms of ESG um, uh, uh, reference, uh, are companies that have been investing on that for many, many years. This is not something that you achieve from night to day. So you have to have a strong commitment. You have to be very coherent in terms of your culture and your strategy. Uh, and you, as I said, uh, when we talk about governance, it's not, just, not, just not a matter of uh, checking points on and like uh, the format of governance that, for example, companies that are like have a, a capital, uh, that like IPO companies have to, to take into account for to be to be in the market is much more than that. Is the subtleties and the what I say is the feeling of the of the governance that actually makes the whole difference in the in culture. So I would say that much more than the financial argument, I would say that employee engagement, community engaged engagement is by far the strongest uh, case for innovation for sustainable prosperity, for uh, crea creativity, and like all sources of uh, uh, non-financial that actually produces financial. Excellent. You started actually covering some of uh, the next things that I had in mind when you were mentioning that, of course, companies uh, that do succeed tend to make it for the long run. So it's not a one-off, but it's a sustained effort to be dedicated, committed, and making sure that things happen. Uh, can you elaborate more also, what are other success criteria? What are, let's say, the companies that tend to uh, do well on this front, what are they doing? What is the secret uh, behind this? Uh, that could be the next question. Then if you may, you can also use the same opportunity to, to, to share with us the companies that are not succeeding what is making them failing? So it is what, uh, two questions in one, if you can. I think it's like, uh, it's the same question for both, for, for the ones who are succeeding and the ones who are not succeeding is what I call is strategy and culture integration. So companies who are looking at ESG merely as um, marketing strategy, or a, just a communication, a communication um, uh, set of ideas that to put in the sustainability report are not being consistent in their practices and actually make it worse because everybody's looking at it. So when you see companies going public saying, oh, I'm gonna actually to reduce carbon footprint in X percent or 100%, by 2030 or 2050. Uh, so they're making a public statement. So they're going to be charged for that. So people are going to be looking for them uh, in terms of whether they're going to deliver that or not. So if you're not actually saying, um, like, uh, with a true commitment with your strategy in your governance model, 
it's going to make it much worse for you. It would be better not saying anything uh, because actually that is going to show that you're only using that as a marketing strategy. So the main component, component for success is the true commitment of long-term strategy for transition to low carbon economy. And this is not my point of view. This is in the Larry Fink letter that he publishes every year. So this year in particular, uh, the letter makes a strong statement for a transition economy. So is a, how companies are gonna actually showing uh, a very, by a very clear and, uh, and, and straightforward commitment for this transition. So they wanna look at your, their, their, their uh, financial results. They wanted to look at how they are actually committing themselves to the investments. They wanted to look to compensation. They wanted to look to diversity. So more and more investors are looking for very objective data. It's not just a thought or an intention. So companies that are not actually truly committed and that is not actually shown in their long-term strategy, they're not going to succeed. And they're going to actually do more harm than good to themselves because it's going to very, it's going to very clear to the audience that they're just doing like greenwashing. Uh, so for me, it's a very straightforward uh, answer, Tahiro. It has to be for real. And uh, investors are looking at CAPEX. They wanted to look at the compensation. They wanted to look to diversity ratings. They wanted to look... Um, of uh, like uh, innovation, so what companies are doing to make the transition, and it's not it's not uh, it doesn't surprise why the letter from the investor it starts with like dear CEO, because uh, it's looking at the leadership of the company, asking that leadership of the company to show in a very straightforward, objective terms what are the commitments and how that is linked to the strategy and to talent attraction, to talent compensation and so forth. So it has a whole coherence system that is gonna be checked out. Excellent, thank you. Now, now, now let, let's look at it because of course, when you mentioned it's the long-term piece, many organizations maybe haven't necessarily embraced it or they haven't necessarily started the journey. So if you are, in a, you are in an organization that say, okay, today I want to make it front and center. I want to give it uh, the, 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 the attention required, but not just for a communication matters, not just for paying lip service, but because you strongly believe in it and because you are also aligning your, the employees within the organization around it. The question that may come here is, how do they start? What 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 will be first step? Excellent question, Tahiro. I like I'm going to always have a bias to education, what I believe bright line as well. So first first step, let's educate the board. So board members and there are many studies that show that board members are not really aware of their role in that agenda. So let's educate the board and the C lab of the company. So what is education has to take into account? First thing, a uh, systemic view of risk assessment. Uh, so it has to be very pragmatic. Systemic view of risk assessment is like a long-term risk assessment. And at the same time, a strong view with value creation assessment. That actually is gonna help companies to establish a plan for in a roadmap for a transition. And the second step after that plan is to look at everything we are doing, how we can improve. So I'm gonna give you a bit of an example here. Let's talk about the supply chain system. So there are lots of systems in place that talks about supply chain finance, how to actually invest in our supply system in order to provide uh, the type of raw material and the services I need. So can I improve that? Is there a room for sustainable supply chain finance? Of course there is. And that is a market that actually it's expected to grow 
and to be one like uh, almost 20% a year and to 2027. Uh, and uh, just the sustainable piece of that can be one third of highly secured receivables. So there's a huge market to rethink the way I do supply chain finance. I can incorporate uh, KPIs, I can incorporate another way to finance with the things I already do. Let's look at my corporate venture capital hub. How can I look for new ideas and innovation that can also help me to change as a company or my supply chain system? So once I have that plan, it's a very long-term plan uh, owned by the board and also aligned with the sea level I'm going to look at the things I do and I'm going to actually change the way I access the capital market, looking for financing models that take into account, for example, ESG goals. Uh, for example, there's a, there's a new, like a recently new product in the financial sector called sustainability linked loan. Those type of loans are based on ESG targets. So the more I attain them, I can reduce the cost of my capital, the cost of my uh, attracting the, that, that capital. So I have an incentive. So, so companies can really rethink the things they do, but everything starts from the board. I like very much a literature on enacting purpose initiative by, uh, is, is led by Ox Oxford University and other, uh, other universities in the United States. And it shows the importance of the board to own the ESG statement and help the company to construct a long-term view of the transition. So for me, this would be the first, like educate the board and let the board own, together with the C-level, the long-term a plan of ESG transformation. And then it's gonna prompt the company to revise and rethink all the investments they already do, either in supply chain system, corporate venture capital, um, new products, and you name it. So it's gonna be like, as I say, a chain reaction that is gonna transform the company to capture value through ESG transformation. Excellent. And I'll just have a segue here. I'll just have a segue. Of course, we mentioned the board and we mentioned the sea level. Uh, and we see that uh, uh, now, and even when you look at transformation in general, it is the employees within the organization that are demanding it. It is the employees. Some people, uh, or let's say if you want to go to a company, it is employees looking at uh, basically if the organization is, is adhering to this principle before even considering joining. So what force do you see in the employees, like say the people on the ground supporting the organization and playing a role? Because we tend to say that uh, whenever an organization is embarking a transformation, it's not just about the, I mean, where the organization wants to go, but it's also about where the individual employees within the organizations are taken. So I get it, the board, the C-level, but I want to hear from you, the employees. How do you bring them or how do you have them as a power that will shape that agenda for the organization? You're absolutely right. Like when, like when employees have that clear statement and the coherence checked by the board, they definitely gonna be the main uh, change power in the organization. And you have two uh, motors of this change. First, talent attraction. So the, the most talented or the most, uh, uh, with the, uh, I prefer the work like uh, skill and, 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 uh, and uh, competencies uh, that are relevant for that, for that industry will be attracted when they see the, the coherence like all over the organization. But there's also a risk uh, uh, is there's another, also another motor, which is the risk of those employees, especially the youngest ones, because it's another generation is much more committed with a purpose um, that that like to do like a whistleblowing of the things they don't agree. 
And this is something like a risk that more like more and more companies are taking into consideration. It is a very is a very strong uh, 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 change motor, which is the whistleblowing process. That when the company is not following that coherence in the way they present themselves to society, how they actually do things, employees can really be a source of information for the public. Truly, uh, and that is going to become more and more is like stronger um, with the like social media and the opportunities for employees to really vent and voice the things that are ethically incoherent. So either from the side of uh, attraction, uh, if you wanted to attract the most talented, the most skillful, the more competent people, they're gonna look at those set of, uh, of us, uh, the, the system in place, and if at the end of the day, we're not following the things you promised, you have the risk of employees making like a public those incoherences. So I don't like very much for the light of the threat, but this is something that companies definitely have to be aware of, uh, that they have to look at uh, delivering the promises. The promises are good for attraction and to make those employees engage. And of course, that that talks to governance. So for the governance has to have, give space for them, for them to lead, for them to create their own innovation. They have to be compensated for that. So there has the whole issue of how the culture uh, supports uh, innovation and is tolerant to error and so forth. But uh, I think the main model here is delivering the promise to them. So attract, but at the same time, allow them to experience uh, that the reality matches the promises. Uh, so let, let's start with the first question from the, uh, that we got actually from Olusehe Olakami. And uh, the question is uh, uh, about, uh, is there a standard framework on sustainability that companies can adopt? Have you seen a detailed RFP covering these areas? So uh, I don't know what RFP, I, I don't uh, know what is. Yeah, RFP is usually a request for proposal, ah, meaning okay, that okay. Uh, you send a request for proposal and you detail what you want to see in the RFP. Uh, so those are different things. For example, uh, in terms of a standard framework, the two most cited and used for reporting is the GRI, Global Reporting Initiative, and the SASB, SASB uh, materiality matrices, and also uh, reporting uh, parameters for, for ESG. So um, both of them have uh, uh, opportunities for companies to rethink what we, we said uh, earlier on in this talk about ESG materiality. Uh, it's always important to take into consideration that those are references for reporting. Uh, in the financial sector, you have the ratings. Uh, so ratings from Bloomberg and from other providers, uh, Refinitiv and you, you name it. Um, but those ratings, as is expected to, uh, they don't correlate much with each other. So the MIT has a very interesting project called Aggregated Confusion, showing that the ratings have a low correlation because there's still a lot of subjectivity uh, in how we actually take into consideration this type of information in the, in the uh, pricing modeling. But that's not, that's not to be disencouraging because this is a matter of time, very quickly technology will evolve for these informations to be captured and put in those um, rating models. So for companies to begin with, a good starting point is either, uh, and also uh, like there, there, like there's some, some special um, references depending on the sector, for example, for banks, there's, there's the TCFD, but particularly for the corporate world, either GRE or SASB are a good reference model for to start the conversation. 
Of course, uh, consulting companies and there are consulting companies that are doing a very relevant work can also be partners for this type of assessment and allow companies to make uh, a good, um, um, uh, how do I say, customize the look at their, uh, at their activity and how that produces impact. So it's good to have a reference, like a global reference, so companies can have something comparable to other companies. So otherwise, they're going to look only at themselves and they're going to have produced something comparable. Um, Wonderful. But, uh, yeah, well, look at yeah, oh, go ahead if you still have, because I was going to move to the next question as well. Uh, um, go ahead. I, I, uh, the next question is from Shuan Sadregazi, and uh, he's saying, why there is so much hot hair and uh, lip service around the ESG's initiative? Of course, you mentioned that uh, companies that don't use it or that, that uh, pay the lip service to it uh, would not be successful. Actually, it could be even worse. But Irrespective of that, why, as he's asking or she's asking, why why uh, a company paying that lip service? Because the fin it's as simple as that. Because the financial market is already putting a pricing on that. You can tell you're going to have a huge debate on whether this pricing is correct, it's over, it's under, like uh, it's not the, the, the point here. But by the time the financial sector starts to putting a pricing on that, Everybody wants to capture that, either making my stock market, my stock value increase or have the perception of a increase or in the way I access capital for financing. Uh, so there's a, now an expression ca called greenium that some companies that have like green projects can capture capital in the market at a lower price than whether they didn't have any project related to that. Uh, for, I think this is something that's a word of cash on here. Uh, if, by the time the financial sector, sector starts to put a price and compensate companies that have green or ESG projects more uh, coherent to that, of course, companies will hush into, look how beautiful I am as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, the financial market is becoming more and more skillful in capture those information because they are aware of the, the like a side effect that is not desirable of the greenwashing. So let me look myself on prettier so that I can have access to this, to this cheap resources or to this more valuation, that favorable valuation of the stock market uh, so that I can capture value. But this is not a, a, a real value capturing. This is just a, is a, is a, is a short term. Um, impression that soon the financial market will correct. Excellent. We'll take uh, one next question before uh, moving to the clo closing remarks. And that one is coming from uh, Sergas Shafi. And uh, the question is, are you seeing technology playing a role in helping to support these goals and initiatives? Of course, uh, I mean, beside the ESG, one thing that you hear a lot is digital transformations, and we got a lot of technology that is coming in. So, what role could technology play uh, to help? Uh... It's huge. Yeah, I'm glad for this question. The World Economic Forum establishes that uh, for the transition to low carbon economy, and either for good, because I want to live in a world that it, has, it produces less impact, uh, either social environment, or whether I do that for pain because I don't want to suffer taxation for that, uh, the World Economic Forum established that 80%, 80% depends on new technology to be invented and accelerated to change the production systems in place. So that's the reason we have to talk about transition and not something that you're gonna change from night to day. Uh, because it requires uh, financing of these technologies. It, it requires long-term planning for companies to adjust and revise the production system. So 80% uh, is what the World Economic Forum predicts the importance of new technologies for the transition uh, to a low carbon economy. So it's huge, it's a huge component of this equation. 
Excellent. So, I mean, digital transformation, ESG, you put them together and then you have a nicer uh, way of uh, delivering results and uh, changing And things. I can, like, to that question, Tahir, I don't know if you still have time, I would love to present, like, a, a, synth a very synthetic model of value capturing uh, of the ESG. I don't know if you have time. Okay. It's Maybe a good you, timing. You can present it and we'll use it as a way to close in, and with that you can deliver your closing remark as well. Perfect. So if you bear with me, what I wanted to show in this chart is has everything with technology and strategy integration. So if you look at the vertical axis, um, you see the level of subjectivity in the information regarding ESG. And uh, right now, there's a lot of information that is more um, related to the human analyst to input that information because these facts are is still in transformation, is, is to be precified, is to be captured. But by the time you have uh, the, this, these variables identified and uh, the value and impact of them shown in the price models and the risk assessment models, uh, and this is pretty much due to technology as well, technology to capture this information, uh, you're gonna see a move uh, in, the, in the whole issue of uh, what is my horizontal axis, value appropriation of the ESG in terms of the value of the businesses and the value of the companies. Uh, so this increase of objectivity and is, really makes the case for a new equilibrium point in which you're gonna have, true to technology and true innovation, the possibility to have a much more appropriation of value by companies. So that's the reason this is like uh, the whole idea of transition. And for this area where they, I put line in yellow, to be really appropriated, there comes the three pillars that we are talking about ESG. The systematic, systemic and systematic assessment uh, of uh, risks and opportunities. The strategy integration, which is the whole coherent thing I'm, not, we talked about, and the importance of the, three, the third pillar, which is governance, which is the role of the board, the role of the C-level, and as a consequence of the employees to carry this change. So it's very important to make that point clear that many people say, oh, because information is too subjective, companies will actually appropriate that to do a, a bit of greenwashing and take advantage, and this is gonna be just a fashion. Not true, because technology itself is gonna generate much more data for that to be included in the models that are gonna put a price and a cost in either ESG or non-ESG practices. And when that becomes a reality and is becoming a reality soon, companies that are in the right side of the equation, value, we're gonna capture value much more strongly. So that's the point I wanted to actually, to show, to synthesize the importance of a look at a long-term systemic model of value, of value creation. Um, so I think that that will be my, final remarks to make the points more clear, I hope more clear based on the conversation, nice conversation we had, Tahiro. Thank you so much, uh, Carolina. And I would like to thank everyone who joined us for this uh, session and thanking also Yavnika for putting it together. This is our transformation talk and we'll be looking to come back uh, more and more with these nice uh, discussions and covering insight that will be useful to help organization transforming and being successful in uh, in this transformation. So uh, I, I, I'm very pleased that we had that talk here. And uh, I'll say again, we can do good and then we can do well as well. So uh, until then, uh, thank you everyone. And then we look forward uh, to have you in another transformation talk uh, brought to you by uh, Brightline. Take care. Thank you very bye -bye, much, Tahiro, Yannika, everybody. It was a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. Really appreciate it.